Hello, hello, hello. We've got a new laser to test out. So here I go, designing yet another lamp. But this time I won't have it fully parametric. I won't even know the final look of it before it's assembled. Instead, we'll try out this hybrid approach. A bit of CAD, a bit of trust in the process, and a lot of improvisation. And let's start, let's start with the CAD part. Okay, so we'll build up on a concept that I have done for Big Rappy some time ago. It was a design for a lamp that minimizes material use or material waste uh, by using these concentric um, circular elements, right? That stack quite well on a flat sheet. And I think this can be improved and it can be improved by introducing a spiral. I'll get to that. Before we do so, we open up Rhino and in Rhino, I already have prepared myself a sheet with 400 by 400 millimeters because that's the material that I have bought, right? 300 millimeter thick plywood, that's 400 by 400 millimeters wide and long, right? So in this, I want to create a spiral, because if you cut out a spiral and you expand it, you get a volume. And that's what we're going to try and do and see if that can actually be made into a lamp. So to do so, <clears throat> just very easy, spiral, flat, right in the middle of the sheet, snapped to the top and rolled down onto the middle, like so. It does 50 turns in total and we have ourselves this, uh, this spiral. The problem is that once we kind of expand it, it's just going to be a pretty boring cone that does not have any uh, directionality. So I'll also scale it, oops, not like this, like this, scale it down, right? This should make it so that, you know, the, the lamp that we produce is a little bit uh, droopier, right? The next step is to actually create a spine on which this lamp will sit. And I have drawn already a little curve here. So this spine, and imagine this spiral just kind of being expanded, expanded, sorry, on top of it. And considering that this is uh, three millimeters thick plywood, then the spine, of course, will need to be stacked out of multiple layers so that is strong enough. But uh, now I'm jumping the gun. Before we do so, uh, before we start stacking things, we need to create ingresses or grooves inside of the spine so that there's always like registration for where every single layer of the spiral can sit. Also, before I forget, adding the end to the spiral is kind of important or else it's not going to fall out, right? Same thing for, for this part. Like this part, even though it looks nice, this is going to be way too problematic. So I'll just end it here. Like so. Okay, so back, back here. Since this spiral does 50 revolutions, I will just select this top curve here and I'll divide it by 50, like so. And then I have prepared this grasshopper script that I will show you. That basically takes, I'll, I'll, I'll guide you through it as best as I can. It basically takes all of these points, right? These points are then moved by four millimeters upwards, right? A line is drawn downwards, that is four times two millimeters, so eight millimeters in length. So you have these lines drawn from these points. Then that line gets extruded to the right to form a rectangle. That rectangle is moved back to the left by half of the extrusion right? And by the way, the extrusion here is set to 3.3 because that's like three millimeters of the material and 0.3 for the error, right? To take care of the error. So it's moved back by half of that. And then the, the, the border of it is ex, ex, extracted and joined up into back into a rectangle. And what this achieves is basically every point gets this kind of a slit or, or box that will be used to produce a slit. You'll, you'll get what I mean in well, just a second. If I change these sliders here, you can see that I can make the slits bigger and I can make them wider or thick, thinner, right? So 3.2, for example, right? Once this is baked out and I have my rectangles here, I can also adjust them, of course, before I move forward, because for, for example, in this, in this case, um, the end of the spiral will sit kind of awkwardly here. 
So what I want to do is just move it in like that, thus creating this, this gap or making this gap a little bit smaller. Same thing here. And then I will use a wonderful tool called Curve Boolean. Oops. Curve Boolean. Click there. Voila. You have yourself a spine element that can eat up a bunch of uh, these smaller, uh, whatchamacallit, ribs. Can we call them ribs? Like spir sp spiral elements, right? Can be stacked here. You'll get what I mean once we actually start cutting and assembling this. I have actually already prepared the cutting file right here, which has our spiral, right? With marks for where the top is. And also it has these uh, ribs with holes in them, right? This is for hanging them. And here I am just making two um, spine layers, I guess you can call them. But in reality, it's going to be closer to five because I will want to add a, an LED light that is running along the bottom part of it with and glued in with double sided duct tape or resin uh, glue. I'll, I'll decide, right? So that's that's the idea. And with this, we stop working in the screen and we begin producing, which brings us to the laser cutter that was sent to us by Akmer. It's called P3 and it's a fun little machine that does pack a punch. Just like all of the competitors, the effective cut area of P3 is 400 by 400 millimeters, which I personally find enough for most of the stuff that I do. The machine that I tested has a 22 watt diode module that can realistically cut through 6 millimeter plywood. Cutting thicker sheets is possible, but will get so slow that you'll want a more powerful laser. When it comes to build quality, I am quite impressed. The metal chassis is really rigid and the protective cover, while it is made out of plastic, it seems to be stiff and easy to clean. The only issue that I have is that the protective hood for the diode snaps in with magnets that seem to be quite weak. It won't come loose during operation, but adjusting the Z height with the hood coming loose becomes pretty annoying. And of course, just like with any other modern desktop at laser engraver, you'll get more functionality, nice functionality, such as built-in camera for accurate positioning of the material and uh, as well as the real-time preview, of course, chassis intrusion switch that turns off the machine if you lift the protective hood during operation, air pump to reduce the scorch marks, as well as a flame detection that stops the laser if your material starts burning. All of these points are cool and all, but for me, the reason why I agreed to test this machine is the AP220 smoke purifier that can be bought as an accessory for the P3 laser. Working in an office of 30 square meters with neighbors on all sides, I can't throw the smoke out the window, so this little cube is a must have for me. And after using it for a few days, my thoughts are mixed. The sound is really better than I expected, Take a listen. Okay, so let's do a quick noise experiment. This is me with everything turned off, test, test, test. Then me with the laser, only the laser turned on. That's the sound. I mean, it's definitely audible, but I don't think anyone in the same room would complain about this running. And then we have the fume extractor. Let me turn it on full blast, which by the way, I don't think you would need to do. So now everything is running. 100%. So this is the most noise that you will get. I mean, it's less than a vacuum cleaner, but definitely audible. The neighbors will not complain, so that's a bonus. Cutting 3mm plywood indoors for the first few sheets was great. Almost no smell with plenty of suction power. But then, then it started to degrade. The burned wood smell became, became stronger and stronger until the built-in filter replacement beep started well beeping. After checking it up close, it seems that the glue used in plywood just completely clogs up the first high density pre-filter really quickly. I flipped it around and got another few hours of cutting time though. While changing a filter every three hours of cutting seems rough, the saving grace is that they are pretty damn cheap. 
And more importantly, if you cut cleaner materials like balsa wood or cardboard, the lifespan of your pre-filter should increase like tenfold or so. Either way, as per usual, I'll do a video update on the P3 laser as well as the smoke purifier this time after around a year of using it to let you know how they hold up over a longer span. Let's go back to assembling the lamp. Sometimes, not all of the time, but sometimes, it's nice to get away from the precision of the computer. To plan things out the best you can without seeing the final result. Then, as you're carrying out your plan, you can see the end result unfold before you. And if you don't like how it's unfolding, you simply adjust the plan. It reminds you to be more flexible. A very important skill to have in the world of CAD.
Thanks for watching. All files are available for Patreon supporters, as per usual, in the video description below. And I'll see you in the next one. Later.